And when did you yourself act as a good teacher, coach, support in somebody else's learning project? Just as a teaser for you. Please, Marike. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit uh, like a, um, a jump into the cold water, as we say in German, um, because um, um, at the same time yesterday, I was not aware really that I give that presentation today. And um, although I prepared for Wednesday, but something a little bit more different with some practical exercises. So, um, but I thought that this is maybe not um, the best forum to do it here. So um, you are safe. You don't have to do some, some um, practical task with me. So you just have to listen and I hope that I can inspire you a little bit with um, some experiences, ideas, thoughts, what I um, met or have done in the last three years. So because I have the pleasure to be a coordinator, not only of the Law Gym project, but also about the Mela project, um, which is Modernizing European Legal Education. Um, we're also Belgrade University and Cardiff University are partners. So, and um, just I, I just came back from uh, Jerez, so from the campus of uh, the, the, where the law faculty is situated in uh, Cadiz. Um, so, and we talked one week about teaching um, and teaching methods um, and how conservative our legal education is usually. So, and um, I try to combine not only my ideas, but also ideas from colleagues. Um, and I hope that it's maybe not so confused, so, but I try to, to structure it a little bit. So, um, yeah, I changed the title to Rethinking Innovative Teaching, so whatever innovation is. So, um, and, and try to adjust here with the techniques. Yeah, but then I can't see the people on the right hand side. So, better? Yeah, that, that's why we're always complaining about students that they are placing themselves in the last rows. So why are professors are doing the same? I don't get that. But it's not the first time that I make this. Yeah, so. But yeah, I have no marks here. So at some um, rethinking innovative teaching, that's how I titled it last night. Um, I hope that I can uh, cope with that title. So, um, and this is, um, I have to give credits to uh, a colleague from um, the University of Santiago de Compostela, so Jose Maria um, Miranda Botto. Um, he gave a lecture just a week ago and he started also with that um, citation and I really like that. Um, and you might wonder why I start with a German military leader, um, Graf Helmut von Moltke. He said, and it's a famous saying, no plan of operation extends with certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy's main strength. So more or less, um, no plan will survive the first contact with the enemy. Um, interestingly, that citation or that quote is um, often um, connected with Napoleon, um, but Napoleon said, I make no plans for military operations. When you compare that to teaching, um, I would say that Napoleon is completely wrong. You should have a plan what you want to teach and what is the, the, the goal and the purpose of your teaching. So, but I also agree with um, Formolke um, when you um, put that into context with uh, teaching that you can make a plan but after the first class, you have to adopt your plan. So you have to be flexible when it comes to teaching. Um, whenever, and I guess it's also your experience, whenever you start planning, it, for you it's the most beautiful and best structured plan, and then first day of, um, of the semester, and then after the first day you realize, okay, my plan is maybe not how it should be. And from my point of view, also those who stick with their initial plan are maybe not the best teachers. So adapting to the needs and also to the challenges of your students or of our students might be a characteristic of a good teacher. So um, this is really what I would like that um, maybe people understand. So because 
at the end of the day, we are there for our students and not anymore because we are there just because the university employed us as teachers or as professors. So, um, so keeping that in mind, I, I like the motto. So I, I really thought that is a, a really good thing also, maybe citing a war leader is maybe not the best thing, but he cited also a lot in when it comes to business and management studies um, as a management idea. Um, and he's the grand, grand uncle of uh, one of a very famous resistant fighter, um, von Molke, during the National Socialism. And you know that is the German public holiday or national holiday today. So usually I shouldn't sit here because I would have a day off, but uh, yeah. So um, yeah, keep that in mind during the presentation. Um, so what are our main drivers? What are our main challenges? And during the last three years, I more or less um, have seen those four topics or yeah, themes as, as, as our main drivers. So the purpose, why are we teaching? What do we want to achieve? The students as those who we teach, um, the topics of what we teach, and also the techniques, so how we teach. So that are the four things I would say we should think about, work on, and, and, and maybe um, change if we think there is a change needed or not. So, um, but that are the four things for me personally. So I, I mainly share my ideas with you. So, and uh, you can agree with me, but you can also criticize that. It's, uh, and it's of course something which is shaped from a German background and it might be, and, and I know that it is different in different countries. So, um, that is what I learned during the Mela project, where we have all in all 10 partners, so from all over Europe, and the experiences are very, very different. So what is the purpose of legal education? And I think that we can all agree on. So first, we want to teach our students legal analysis. Um, that's for sure everywhere in the world the same. Practical skills, um, more in other countries than in Germany, due to our system. Um, but also, and this becomes more and more important from my point of view, the professional identity formation. So we want, or we have to or should make out of our students a personality. Um, because many of them will have a leading role afterwards as an advocate, a prosecutor, a judge, or somebody else. Many of them go to politics, so they should have some personality. Um, and when it comes to that, it's also um, why we teach. We were all forced by the Bologna process, so not so much also in Germany. We have some, some special, or the special beauty of being a founding member and being able to um, survive the Bologna system. So we still have a state examination when it comes to the legal studies and no differentiation between bachelor and master. But anyway, we are also forced by um, what is the purpose why we teach. So what is the overall goal? What should be the outcome? And the, one of the outcomes should be that we um, teach transversal competences. So, um, and that is one big field in our Mela project, what we are working about. So, and also to think about what are transversal competences, also known as sometimes soft skills, also transversal competences. It's a broader approach, so we more or less identified them as, as, as the important ones, so intercultural skills and global awareness, um, flexibility and adaptability, so strategical and innovative thinking, organization and time management, decision making, teamwork, empathy and ability to build relationships, problem solving, learning orientation, negotiation skills and leadership, as well as collecting and processing information. For me, that's one of the most important ones. It's a very general um, approach, not um, broken down to um, legal studies, but we thought it's maybe easier to um, approach when you have a more general scheme. Um, we then wanted to know how um, the situation is in our faculties. So. Do we really teach that without what we teach? Do we achieve that or not? So 
um, we did a big survey um, on those topics um, and around 20% of the staff replied. So there were two surveys, one um, or questionnaire, one to the faculty management um, and the second is to the teaching staff. Um, and we thought, okay, we maybe get the same um, replies. Interestingly not. So it's very, um, so from my point of view, um, whenever you see a survey which is answered only by the faculty management, you won't get the right picture. Um, I also know that from project management or other things, okay, we all know that we sometimes make the, the world a little bit more beautiful than it is in reality. So, um, but yeah. Interestingly, so when it came to qualifications, knowledge, and I just focus on the master studies because the law gym outcome should be a joint master. That's why I put aside a bachelor and other cycles. Um, so, and it was when you see there's always the importance. So we ask how important is that topic um, and how well is it, is it developed? Um, and interestingly, um, more or less, the faculty management always said it is important, of course, so five were, was most important, um, and it's always very well developed. So you see the difference between um, the numbers is not that high. So we have um, just in general, so, so communication skills, we have learning skills, we have the ability to, to, to use knowledge, to, to um, have an understanding, but also to apply the knowledge. So all in all, we think that everything is important, um, more or less in the same range, so 4.5 up to 4.75, that's not a big difference. Everything is important um, and everything is very well developed. So from a faculty management point of view, there is no big need for any big changes. Um, Interestingly, we then did also the, um, the question, um, and I skipped that, so to the, the same questions more or less to the teaching stuff. And there you see a com not complete, but a different um, picture. So when it comes to read, and we broke it down in, in, in more um, single skills. So for example, research skills, you have there um, a difference of around 20%, and that is more or less what you can see in most of the skills. So applying knowledge and practice, which is one of the most important things when you have the theoretical um, um, knowledge, what you learn in law, you have to apply it also in practice. And there we have a difference um, of up to 30%. That's a lot. So communication of legal arguments, also that our students are not so very well um, in um, communicating what they want to say um, or to, 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 to construct a legal argument. Um, information management skills, that's, that's a bit better. Um, problem solving also not so good, but then decision making. There we have around 40% difference between the importance, but also the uh, development. So of course it's it's most important thing as a lawyer that you can make a decision. So if you can't do that, that's, that's a problem. Computing skills, also that, and we ask for basic computing skills. We haven't asked for anything really, really um, experienced. Um, working um, autonomously, um, also that is, uh, it, it's okay. Language skills, that was a big difference between the single faculty. So in Germany, we don't have language classes um, during the studies. So in Belgrade, that's different. So very different um, uh, topics, uh, very different results. Um, the same is for the field of creativity. So thinking out of the box, and that's maybe something which becomes much more um, important for the future because um, what we have seen, and I think that's also, and we discussed it in the, the Miller Consortium, it's also true for other countries, there are up to 25% of our students are not going to classical legal fields. So they, they go somewhere completely different and where they need that skill a bit more than as maybe as an attorney or a judge or somebody else, thinking out of the box to be creative with the knowledge what I have. Then also critical and self-critical thinking. 
not very well developed. Communication with non-experts, that's something what is, um, um, I would say, criticized for ages now, so, but yeah. Uh, same uh, leadership was also around 20%, and then we come to everything what comes with the um, creating a personality, so ethical commitment, but also the commitment to diversity and multicultural, culturality, oh my God, that's a, a nice word, but also working in an international context. So um, if you see that, um, it's a bit better, but still also a lot have to be done. So, and when you see that, you would say, okay, um, Bologna process or Bologna ask us to teach transversal competences. Um, I have never get uh, getting so many um, questions um, about what is meant with leadership what is meant with ethical commitment. So most of the people we asked didn't know what we asked because they have never ever heard about that. Now we're coming back to that slide. The problem is there's no formal training and most of the faculties of, um, in the Mele Consortium, only 34% have a formal training um, how to teach at their university. And there was no, no single, um, workshop or anything on how to teach law. So nothing. Um, and if you see that and then you see what you have to teach and you don't know how to teach, that's, that's a problem. So that, that, that's one thing. So we have to, to, to um, address a purpose, but we don't know how. And to be honest, it's not our fault why we don't know how to do it because nobody taught us to do that. Um, I'm a qualified lawyer, so I have to, I have a bar exam, I have a PhD, um, but nobody asked me to educate myself in teaching. I've done that because our university, and maybe we are the 34%, I don't know, um, have some certificate in how to teach and some didact didactics. Um, but to be honest, that's also a very general approach, nothing really special. And I think that should be changed because, yeah, there is the born um, teacher, the born entertainer who can go in front of the class and 400, 500 students will listen to him, her until the end. But to be honest, in all of my studies, and I also did a master, um, I have seen maybe two professors who had that ability. Um, and that's really talent. So um, that they, they are so good. Um, anyway, so, so keep that in mind that maybe we have to work on that. That sounds one of the conclusions of the Mela project that we said there has to be a formal um, workshop teaching, however it should look like. And we also have that, and here I also have to give credits to two um, um, colleagues of um, us from the Belgrade University to Valeria Dabitic and Maria Flakovic, they started a, a survey questionnaire at the Belgrade faculty talking about who's your audience, so who is your student. So, and interestingly, and, and I think that's the first time that this really um, came so obvious that there is a problem between the teacher generation and the student generation. So if you see that, we have the baby boomers, which goes until, so that's the date when you were born. So until 1960, then we have the generation X until 1980. We have the generation Y until 95, and then we have the generation Z, uh, everybody born after 95. And then you could put also again the generation alpha, I think that's everybody born after 2005, 2010, I'm not quite sure. So, um, and you can ask yourself, who are you? So um, I'm between generation X and Y. So um, that's um, my, so between a hippie and a hipster, I don't know. So, um, but yeah. Um, and if you see that, and then keeping in mind the thing that, all generations are characterized by different um, um, ideas and different, um, um, how to say that, um, preferences, um, then you should also draw some conclusion out of that. So when you see, for example, 
the generation set um, when you go to the um, leadership styles um, they like empowering so generation Z was empowering or generation Y was guiding and there are people who are saying between guiding and empowering there are not so much differences um, generation alpha wants to be inspired so um, whatever inspiring means but that's a little bit different than guiding or empowering um, and also when it comes to the learning style, so a generation Y is interactive, so that were the first who started maybe in a more virtual scheme, whatever we call it. And then generation Z, multimodal, and then generation alpha, virtual. So virtual. So, um, and also how they, 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 they communicate. So there are differences and, and, and to break that down, so that's, uh, I know that's a very or, or very interesting um, preferences, but uh, some you might not understand um, without the, the broader explanation. Um, so when you break that down, and I have to say that um, we have one main conclusion is so to say that you have the lecturers who are baby boomers or generation six and y, X and Y, and we all grew up in a more analog world. So um, I think my first cell phone I got in late 90s, middle late 90s, and I was one of the first ones. Um, and the students of generation Z and Alpha, they are complete digital. So they, when I see my nephew who is two years old and he can um, use my cell phone in a better and easier way than I can do that, so that's completely um, amazing but also his way of, of learning is completely different. Um, so, and that's why we have to keep in mind who is our audience. So we have to adapt to that, to say, okay, no, but the good old times, I also like to read a very good book and I'm, I'm always in a fight with our librarian because I order books in print. Um, and she hates me for that because she has to store the books. And of course, the storage room is always a problem, but I hate ebooks. So I know that they are very practical, but I still, I still have the problem how to highlight things. So I will always be the one if there's an ebook who prints it out and this is not climate friendly and so on. But yeah, we have to adapt. So um, I've also learned to give my students um, online sources and not any more printouts, although I force them also to go to a library and not thinking that um, the online library is the only thing what they can see. So I think we have to balance those needs a little bit better than we do at the moment. Um, and to break it down also to, to keep in mind, um, Generation Z really likes teamwork. We in Germany do not teach a single um, format of teamwork during our studies. No, nothing, it's a complete individual um, 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 study. They like equality, so they want to be equal, also equal with the professor. And um, I don't know if you already um, experienced that. I sometimes have a fight with some students because they think I'm, I'm their friend. I'm not their friend, I'm, I'm somebody who has to mark them. But at the end of the day, this is how they work and they work a little bit better if you don't have a huge hierarchy. Um, and they, of course, like also pleasant working at atmosphere, what comes also with low hierarchies. And of course, and this is something completely different, I would say, from compared to 10 years ago, they need a constant and positive feedback. If you start criticizing, as you or well, I changed my way of critical um, feedback because they are not able to cope with that. And I don't know why, maybe because they are in Germany, there are so many single childs and they are the, the heroes of their family. So, and they usually don't get that much critical feedback, but usually they are not so, when you give them a hard critical feedback, they can't cope with it. So to do it in, in a more positive way and also constantly is a much better thing. So that's something what I experienced. It could be different in your country, in, in, in your university, but this is how we, or 
what happened to us. And, and, and when I say our students, I mean students from all over the world. So our LLM program welcomes every year um, 42, 45 nations. So um, it's, a, it's a picture from all over the world, so to say. But maybe there are some extra students. So um, Then the other thing, and this was the beauty to connecting it with the Law Gem project for me, was how to mainstream, mainstreaming your topic. So all of us have a field of specialization. So my field is um, European law, European and international economic law. So this is what I usually teach, research, and so on. So, and I was not so much aware of the gender perspective. I knew there are discussions about business quotas and so on, uh, or quotas in, in, in boards of companies and so on. But um, I was not aware so much about the other different fields. So, and that was the beauty of the, or is the beauty still of the Law Gym project, that we all um, discussed what is the gender perspective of every different um, field of law. So, and that made it so unique. Um, and to put that together um, in, in, in different outcomes, that was really an interesting idea. And I think that is the main challenge of the future um, university education, to have a broader approach to a very traditional field of science, to be honest, so of, of, of law, but to open it up to other, um, I would say, general topics. So big societal or big topics which are important for the society um, themselves. So, and that for my point, that are those three, there could be more. Um, but for me, it's gender, um, it's digitalization, and it's environmental issues. So that are the three main things we have to keep in mind for the next century. And maybe less, but um, yeah. This we cannot see as just a top one or something else. We really have to see that as something which, ha which has to be incorporated in our field of, of teaching and, and, and um, uh, specialization. Um, so, and I, I think that would help us to become um, better teachers and to have a better um, educational system. Um, when it comes to the Law Gym project, when it comes to gender mainstreaming, and I think most of you are familiar with the project, so I don't have to go into detail. Um, so, but this also reflects um, the two main outcomes of the Law Gym project. Um, so, and for those who are not familiar with the project, might can look that up. So, um, because we are very proud that we we have um, developed the syllabus um, on law and gender and also to um, bring out the gender competent legal education textbook, so um, which focuses on all those different topics. So, um, and that was really interesting to see, to, to work in interdisciplinary, not interdisciplinary, but multi-faculty teams um, from different backgrounds. Um, and um, I think it's a, it's a perfect outcome, and Ragica was uh, very right. I, we hope that we have um, the online publication published end of October. So um, it will be first online and then it will be printed, of course, so that I can store one, one issue in my, my shelf and can highlight paper and not something digital. So this is how it looks. Uh, so, um, and I think that this was one of the first um, mainstreaming projects um, I've known um, in, in Germany when it comes to something like that. There is another one going on with now with environmental issues. Also very interesting. Um, and we will see. Um, but I think that is really something we did this term mainstreaming. I don't like the word, but to be honest, it, it, it really explains what we have to do in the future. Um, and then something um, also is how we teach, so our techniques. So usually in Germany, a classical um, way of teaching is a lecture. The professor stands in front and um, is talking for 90 minutes. If you have a very interactive one, then he is doing it more in the Socratic style, so with a question and answer, but that's it. Then we have a few other 
schemes like, like seminars or we call it Übung, um, where we solve a case, um, but that's it. So there is no teamwork, no collaboration. It's also due to the fact that we have um, in bigger faculties in the first semesters 100 to 300, 400, 500 students, and we are not, um, we don't know how to, to cope with that number of students. But that's of course not the best way to teach. Um, and we lose a lot of students. Um, that's also something what I know is um, going on in other faculties. They are losing in the first three to four semesters many, many students because they either are not able to cope with the, with, with the, with the subject itself or they find it boring or whatever. So. Um, and whenever we, we want to, to, to rethink teaching, um, I think we also have to remember what should be the learning experience of our students. So um, first of all, of course, we want to, to teach them the foundational knowledge. That's everywhere the same. They have to know the national legal framework. If they don't know that, everything else what comes behind is not necessary to know. Um, they have to know how to apply the law. Um, and this is one of the biggest challenges for most of the students because it's a uh, it's not that easy to understand sometimes why it is like that so then how to to integrate the law in in different uh fields but also and 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 to think a little bit out of the box and to connect it with other topics so maybe not something what a judge needs but maybe for other professions it is important then, of course, the human dimension, as I already said, but also caring, so to, to raise the awareness for a special topic. Um, and then also, and this is, I think, for attorney or not for lawyers, the most important thing, learning how to learn. Um, law is always developing and we have to uh, be up to date. So um, in my field, EU law, um, I would say, and especially competition law, there are a lot of changes every day, more or less. So, um, and if I would not know how to how to keep up to date, that would be really a problem. Um, so, whenever we want to to change something, we need to know um, which technique um, is addressing which part of the learning experience. So, in a lecture, might only go on the first. Um, button, dot, whatever, so circle, um, and that's maybe to less. Um, so when it comes to interactive teaching, what the Mailer um, project did, we discussed a lot of different formats, um, especially applied to law, and some you already know, some maybe not. So case studies, I think everybody knows who studied maybe law. So um, we divided them a little bit into one is which is based on a judgment, so some facts which are already in place, and it's, a, it's a purely just solving the case. Um, or you create a hypothetical scenario, um, a fictional case, um, and there you can also, and this was really interesting, so Jose Maria from Santiago, he said that he creates a, an own world. So he, um, at the start of the semester, he creates, the, let's say, fiction town and with um, some personalities and they commit crimes, they, they have uh, labor issues, they have whatever. So um, which makes it maybe easier for the students to understand um, what is the overall impact um, of their legal problem. Then, of course, clinical legal education. Most of you have that. We in Germany, we don't have that that often. Um, so it's either a live client clinic um, or what also is possible are policy labs or you simulate something like this. Um, this depends how your national law is also structured. So I know in Serbia, a live client clinic is not possible, but also other um, scenarios could be. Then we discussed a lot mooting. I guess everybody knows moot courts um, or mock trials. Um, that's what we are sometimes using to give awareness, especially about procedural law. Um, if 
because you are simulating the, the trial from the very beginning until the very end. And the moot court, you are more or less just exchanging arguments in front of a bench or already before in some um, um, written documents. Um, what we also doing a lot nowadays are simulations. So EU law and international law is, of course, very um, open to that because um, you make decision-making scenarios. Um, so I often play with students EU Council meeting or WTO World Trade Organization meeting. So, um, and it is, it is very interesting to see how students learn how complicated decision making is, um, especially when you represent a country. But also case-based scenarios, that's what we have done just a week ago. We, we had a um, scenario of a very interesting, a PhD researcher who um, did some, um, um, it was a Parkinson um, re or research on Parkinson and how early um, face movings give um, signs for a Parkinson um, uh, for the Parkinson disease, and and she wanted to, and and she collected uh, interviews and 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 face videos and so on, and she, then a company asked the PhD researchers um, if she would um, transfer the um, results to her for developing an app or something, and there were different um, roles like a lawyer, like an ethical commissioner of the university and, and so on. So, And it was really interesting to see how well that worked. Um, funnily, we were not so good as the students, so um, we are too much shaped in our thinking um, and that was our outcome. Yeah, so that's what I, uh, because all others are also maybe simulations. And of course, and this is also something um, what we use nowadays a little bit more, are digital tools. So asking students to write for PLOC um, and to make some, some, how to say that, um, tournament, championship or something like that with it. <laughs> Um, and also what the colleague of Santiago, from Santiago also said, he's asking um, his students to open a Twitter account for the semester and commenting. He's um, teaching something in labor law, but I also thought about that. I'm also teaching EU external relations to do that um, with the students. So they have to comment and have to, to um, follow the external relations of the European Union for a semester could be also interesting, and it seems that most of the students have a lot of fun. The problem is I also have to open myself a Twitter account. So far, I have none, so um, that would be the next social media thing. So you see I'm still Generation <laughs> XY, so I'm not so used to it. So, um, But yeah, these are interactive teaching um, um, possibilities. There may be many more, and I'm happy to learn um, about it. So. Um, for the Logem project, um, we also try to, or we, we set up a clinical legal education scheme. So, um, and we will see how this uh, works out. Um, of course, what we all have to keep in mind, um, it's for sure lots of fun to teach in a different way, but of course it's also a lot of work. Um, I don't want to, to keep that secret for me, but simulations are, really, really a lot of work. Um, and also being um, a supervisor in a legal clinic, also that is a lot of work. So um, yeah. Um, that's why we decided, and especially younger um, um, colleagues have um, have problems with with all with have getting an overview of all the teaching methods. Although I now learned that also the older ones are appreciating that we put together all what we have done, so the survey, what I have shown you, that are just a few um, results. We put together in a, in a report about transversal competences. Um, then we are um, working at the moment on different teaching methods to give a theoretical background, but also some examples, um, which is then should construct a teaching method toolbox. Um, and we hope that this helps a little bit um, to um, inspire um, 
other teachers, other professors, assistants to, to rethink their way of teaching. Um, yeah, so, and I also that I inspired you a little bit um, with my ideas, my thoughts, so very personal um, ideas, um, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss them with you, so, and I'm open for questions. Um, that's my way, um, that doesn't mean to be the right way for you. Um, but I really can only um, say I think um, we need to modernize legal education because otherwise we maybe don't have enough judges, attorneys, public prosecutors anymore. So, and um, law is a, is an important topic for our societies, and without um, we might getting into troubles. And we already see that in other parts. So, when it comes to medicine, we already see that. Um, but imagine a world where we have a lack of, or not only will we ha already have a lack of judges, but having regions without any judge, and then we um, maybe are having really a big problem. So, but yeah, many thanks. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussions. Um, you can find more infos on the webpage from Mele if you're interested. You can also send me an email, and of course, yeah, I would say thank you. Thank you, Marike. How are we doing on time? We have time for I some questions, right? There's time. There's time. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so, absolutely. Wonderful to hear um, your comments and, and um, your insights. Um, I have a few thoughts popping around in my head, but I would like to open up to the audience, first of all, if, if there are any questions or reflections and feedbacks to what we have heard from Marike. Yes, please. I would not be that concentrated at the moment when you start explaining the survey uh, where you compare uh, uh, importance and development. Was it done only with teachers or also with students? No, only with teachers. I think that Valeria maybe started at in Palermo um, something with students or want to start with students. It was just focused on teachers. Um, we are thinking about to have a broader project again also with students because, but then from for sure the results will be worse. But that's not the main point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, so I was right. This was related only to teachers, right. yeah. But um, we thought about that, but that is um, hard to say. Or you can use that also, yeah. whatever you want. So, uh, pedagogically speaking, it is much, much more important that students say their opinion about what, what was that what you promised in the outlines of the courses and what you actually really offered us. So their evaluation of our work is much, much more important because our, uh, our self-critical or at all no, no, not critical uh, evaluation of our own wor uh, work is not as much important as of the other side. Um, two answers to that. We thought about that, but first it would have been too big for the project what we applied for, um, because for that we would have um, asked um, an external um, company to do that, because we were such a big consortium. That was first. Second, 
We discussed that also, and I don't know how it is in your faculties, but in our faculties, students' evaluation, and I'm sorry if you are students in, in the room, it is taken into account, but not on a high um, degree, to be honest. So all professors get that, but to be honest, I have never seen a professor who got really bad results that he really has changed something. Maybe a few things, but to be honest, when it comes to the self-critical um, skills or critical, yeah, self-critical skills of students, they are the same worse than for maybe teaching stuff. So it is hard to say to yourself, okay, I did something wrong, but I agree with you. It would be very interesting to see what the students say. But from my point of view, I think that the um, um, results will be worse. And the other thing was a little bit that we thought, um, or not thought, but the idea was that for this we need many more explanation. What are, is meant with decision making? What is meant with computing skills? Everybody would know, but with what we want from them. So at the end of the day, and we were not sure at which point we should ask them. So, because we might should only ask those at the end of their study cycle. So, um, and to be honest, in most of the faculties, those students are not willing to do the survey because they are usually occupied with their last exams. So, few things, but we having that in mind for a new project, yeah. It's interesting, we, we also do student service uh, surveys after each course automatically. Students are not too excited about it. Um, we do change things at times, but it's, it's an interesting discussion because we're actually not there to please the students. We're there to teach them. <laughs> There's a little bit of a balancing act going on in that process. Um, so sometimes they can say um, there was too much work, there was too much reading, and actually maybe that was part of our plan, right? And I would say, particularly in law, you are pushed to handle a lot of material. That's actually one of the soft skills in the end. Um, now, if we didn't manage to communicate to the students, that's then a second level problem, basically. So I think this, this is really a, an interesting area to, to sort of dig into. And the other part is, depending on when you go into um, this, the question of the survey, I mean, we do it after each course, but <laughs> what they think they learned or didn't learn in term one is not identical with what they think or actually learned by the end of their uh, education, not to mention two years down the line in practice, and this comes back. So, so measuring um, is, is really not an absolute science, even if it looks like that on the surface. That being said, interaction, communication with the students, it's a must, of course. Um, and with alumni. Yeah. Please don't underestimate the work or the, the input of alumni. So I'm a deputy head of our alumni association. We are in, in, in regular contact with them and what we get as a feedback from different fields of profession that's so valuable for the adjustment of our master program. So, because this is, they now said to us, okay, you're so, you should maybe think about to focus on compliance in every field. That's the, that's the big hot topic in law, compliance officer, compliance, legal compliance, whatever, human rights compliance, gender compliance. And everybody is reflecting or is telling us we should now do that. And we are really thinking about to shaping our master program in that, in that way. So alumni who are really working in the, in the professional field, they really know what the market needs. And, and, and of course, I agree with most of my colleagues to say we not only educating for the market, but at the end of the day, this is how students choose especially master programs if they have a benefit on the market. So with that, with that, um, uh, with that degree. Um, I'm sorry to say that. So um, that's how it works. Um, yeah. I see Eleonore. Yes. And thank you, Michael, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah. 
we have a runner. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you, Marike, for a very interesting presentation and uh, Rigmoroso for leading a very interesting uh, discussion, uh, which I also think is very important for us if we want to uh, collaborate uh, in the future, uh, because um, uh, I think there we have quite uh, different ways to uh, teach. I've been studying, but it was quite a long time ago in, in uh, Germany, and uh, I I mean, I recognize... It hasn't changed. No, no, I don't think that it has uh, changed. Uh, at uh, our uh, university, we have, uh, the students have a lot of uh, teamwork, the professors, all professors uh, need to take uh, pedagogical uh, courses, and we also have a very uh, active and uh, ever-growing uh, university pedagogical like uh, team uh, who uh, coaches us. Uh, and uh, sometimes as a, as a university teacher, you can almost feel uh, like overburdened on on uh, how to live up with all the demands on on like new pedagogical uh, ideas and to have you know to make examinations in different forms and uh, and so on so that you don't only have written exams but also have uh, give the students a possibility to present orally and and assess that and also assess their uh, capacity to to write and uh, uh, and so, and um, that we work with very many different teaching uh, formats. So I'm really curious to hear about the situation in uh, Belgrade and uh, Lumsa and uh, Cadiz, like how you teach and uh, uh, how you much how much you work with the uh, pedagogical uh, development. And so, so that is one thing. Uh, and uh, my other uh, reaction is that. Uh, you talk very, uh, quite a lot on how you teach law and uh, if, if we are going to make uh, this uh, master in law and gender uh, come through uh, then we have very diverse we will have very, very diverse uh, students and we, they will have very uh, diverse background uh, both in law uh, because they will uh, come from different jurisdictions and uh, I mean, we have a, a complete, not a completely, but, but quite a different approach to the legal sources. If you're from the Nordic legal system, for instance, or if you're from a common law legal system, or if, and so on. So I think that is very, will be very uh, different. Uh, and also that the students will come from, not only from law, but, uh, but as much probably from gender studies, maybe from political uh, science, if we allow them, and uh, and from uh, um, like criminology and uh, social work, maybe psychology and uh, and so on. So I think uh, teaching uh, interdisciplinary is also a great uh, challenge uh, for us. And and I think that you really widen the the uh, perspectives. But I think that there are even more perspectives to to uh, add. So yeah. So thank you. They were all my comments. Thank you. Any reflections from your side? Um, yeah, for sure, uh, there are many more perspectives. To be honest, that's, that's just a few. So I, I already left some aside and some I'm not maybe aware of, um, to be honest. So um, the German studies haven't changed and that's a very German perspective. Um, we are very bound by our system. Um, also, we are now discussing and there will be a major decision uh, made hopefully soon um, that we also have to establish bachelor and masters parallel to the um, state examination then we would be much more flexible also to integrate teamwork and others so I would really love that to be honest so um, but I'm aware that um, there are different ways of, of teaching um, and um, I know that the Swedish universities are much, or the Swedish system is much more open to pedagogical um, concepts than any other system, and and could be worse. And in in France, you all, you still have uh, professors who sit here and they just read the script. So, uh, just reading. I don't. I make no jokes. 
It's, it, it's re literally like this. So uh, my university is five minutes away from France and uh, we sometimes have guest professors. That's horrible. That's really horrible. So it can be worse. Um, but yeah, um, no, I, it, especially I like the interdisciplinary approach. Um, I think that should be somehow included. Also, I know it's, it's one of the biggest challenges when it comes to the academic community, to be honest. So we are always talking about that. But what we usually do is multidisciplinaries um um thinking and working but not interdisciplinary but yeah i agree with you thank you yes may i <laughs> good evening uh, let me introduce myself firstly uh, i'm vincenzo mignano i am phd students in uh, ulo um, first of all, uh, thank you. I would like to thank you for your presentation because uh, I found uh, many interesting points. I also personally, I found uh, uh, several moments uh, of my path uh, in the academia, so at the university. Um, I would like to stress uh, two points, if I may. Um, first of all, uh, I think uh, I found very interesting uh, um, the different tools that you underlined in your presentation. Uh, in particular, uh, because I think that uh, um, students can be, um, of course, uh, um, simulate to analyze, to uh, research if the uh, research path is uh, um, put uh, outside um, with the ordinary path at the university. In my personal experience, I have the possibility to um, uh, making not only exams on my ordinary path uh, at the academia, at the university, but also being part uh, of observatory of research. And in this particular perspective, we have at the Lumsa University uh, a particular observatory research, it's the Observatory Germany, Italy, Europe. We try to stress the uh, political relationship, also the legal relationship uh, between Germany and Italy in the main framework of the European Union. This for me uh, was very interesting, it was very important because as a student, uh, I had the possibility to stress several topics, not only legal, which usually I am a, a judicial, so at the same time, so this is my main topic, but also economic topic. So to spread all my soft competence, but also um, other several competence. I think this is, um, um, a main important point because uh, uh, students with these different tools, uh, we had also a blog, for instance, with these different tools, uh, students uh, are stimulating to promote themselves, promote their research, and also show their research to all, uh, not only the academia, but also um, other students, uh, other university, and so on, also other political institutions. I think this is the, the main point to be stressed. Um, because uh, in our uh, um, educational system at the university level, I think uh, this is the main shortcoming. University, in particular, um, uh, faculty of law in general, generally speaking, are so manualistic, uh, full of notions, but at the same time, uh, they need to be practical. They need to, uh, we need to uh, be. Uh, at the same time uh, in touch with the concrete case, several cases. I think uh, that uh, the possibility to be part uh, of separate research, making research, is one of the most important um, tools in order to um, develop the new academia. So I don't know if I may... Thank you. Thank you. Makes me think of some discussions we've had back in Örebro quite well the last year about, you know, how, at what level, at what baby steps can we actually engage or invite students in our research, right? I mean, they're clearly not full, fully researchers, but how do we sort of plant the idea what the end product hopefully one day will be? Uh, I think that's interesting. And we've, we've made a few tiny experiments along those lines. Yeah, we also, we, we usually employ student assistants. So I'm, and my experiences are so, so we had very good ones. We had ones where we thought, okay, that was maybe not the best idea. Um, and of course the good ones, they are 
they have tasks which we might would also give to somebody who already graduated. So, um, so that always is different. So um, that's really something very. I don't know how to explain. It, it, it depends on the personality of the person, to be honest. How much they want. Some really think, okay, no, this is not what I want to do, and um, not my cup of tea. And 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 also, um, it has nothing really to do with my topic because they are not so open-minded to see that everything, when it comes to EU law, is maybe interconnected somehow. Um, and others who are like a sponge, you can just put a little bit of water and it's it's yeah, it's gone in 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 a minute. So I, I really love to engage students in a in a better way to also open up the um, academia. And in Germany, we are lacking um, people in academia. What is more a systemic structural problem than maybe that people are interested, but it would be. Um, easier if we could open up our research projects to more younger ones. But I don't know how it is in Sweden or in Italy, um, but we sometimes have restrictions that people have to be graduated. So that's sometimes a problem. But yeah, I, I really um, um, like the idea to do that. Yeah. Oh, Micro Robert, where's the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe Tanya and uh, Lubinka will add something, but just to mention, at our faculty, students have been progressively the best. I suppose that only the best can do that, and they, like a sponge, react in, in a proactive way. But systemic solutions are, for example, at the historical department, and at the theoretical department, huge departments of our faculty, where student conferences are organized, student uh, journals with students' uh, papers are also available, and also uh, some professors who are the mentors to students for their master's thesis, they in, in involve, include students into the research. So more and more this kind of stimulation for students has been going on. I think it's very, very positive. When I did a little bit of looking around on, on this activating students or inviting students, I stumbled on a project which they run in Uppsala, Uppsala University, and I'm gonna check if that's still available free online, which it was when I found it. Uh, and they uh, framed or they named the whole project uh, Active Student Partnership, Alternatively Participation. So already in the word, you start sort of signaling whether you're partnering with your student or whether you're just inviting them to a participation, right? Uh, it was an interdisciplinary project, um, no law whatsoever, uh, but a lot of quite inspiring and partly challenging ideas for somebody working in the law department where we're quite stuck in our traditions as, as several have mentioned. But I'm happy to dig it out for tomorrow and see uh, if it's still all available there. I have a little question to you which, which sort of intrigued me when I heard uh, your presentation and it was this issue about Generation Z wanting feedback. <laughs> We've heard that back home in Sweden as well. But yeah, what, what's the thinking around that? What do we do? <laughs> do we just give them the feedback? And particularly as you were framing it, it should be positive feedback. So where's the growth in that? Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, to be honest, it's, we are discussing that a lot among colleagues because it's, um, I learned um, it on a very hard way with a lot of my bosses, bad work, do it again. So not the nicest feedback what you get, but I learned a lot, to be honest. So, and I learned that if I bring bad work because I either was too lazy or not very well structured or not very well whatever, I have to sit down on an Easter Sunday and have to do my homework, so to say, because I have to submit it until Easter Monday in the evening because the professor needs it um, on Tuesday morning. I've learned my lesson. I was much more 
detailed in my future research work. I watch much more thorough in my future research work. But um, if I give that feedback now to students, I'm not so sure. I, um, I bring students to tears, which uh, also brings me to tears, to be honest. Um, that's not a very nice experience. Um, and uh, I always, I, I try to start with something positive, but at the end of the day, I sometimes think, okay, at one point I have to give them the bad feedback because it doesn't help if they do not learn that. I don't know if they are not anymore, if there is a change, and this is maybe some for some generation researchers, I, I read a little bit about that. It seems that there is a tendency that the younger generations are not anymore, they haven't learned what bad feedback is because they're very, um, rarely get that and friends of mine are school teachers and they say also if you do give really a bad feedback you know what the next morning will happen the parents are here and they make my life to hell so they stopped giving bad feedback or real bad feedback or cru cruel bad feedback however you want to call it that's the first thing either they have never learned that and then they end up at university and we have to cope with it or second, they are not any more willing to get this feedback, zero points, bad work. Because that's not a feedback. That's the problem. But um, that we all got maybe in our career, this feedback, bad work, that's it. And you sit there and think, what the hell should I do with that? Bad work, that says nothing. Is the introduction bad? Is the conclusion bad? What is bad? Is my literature work bad? So. Um, at the end of the day, I'll try to give hints. Um, that's and, and and also to to explain what could be made better. And I give often I give them the opportunity to make it again. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 also struggling with that because they, what is positive feedback? I cannot say if that is a, so from so we have a grading system from zero to eighteen. I cannot say to somebody who has failed, it was a, um, a, a nice try. You have failed. It was even not a nice try, to be honest. So um, it was fail. So a failure. So at the end of the day, yeah. I, I'm also struggling with that, what people uh, who are expert in that field asking me to do, and then with the real world, and sometimes think, OK, Maybe they can come with me for a semester or with all other professors at the faculty and at, at the institute, and then they should write the feedback and should give it, we often give oral feedback, which is, from my point of view, more complicated. Um, um, but at the end of the day, yeah. If somebody has an idea, I'm very open-minded to discuss that, to be honest. So, so it would help maybe in my in my future um, lecturing, so yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm still stuck in this feedback stuff. Um, I have a feeling that the students also, and I can understand it, um, desire the feedback from the professors, right? But they do spend a lot of time together. And I seldom, we have had it happen, but I s seldom see them searching actively feedback, coaching feedback from their peers. Mm. And they're likely to spend so much more time with these peers. <laughs> so in my world, it's a missed opportunity. I know we had groups amongst our students where they decide, decide a term one. We're going to stick together. We're going to support each other feedback-wise, coaching-wise. And they did. And they all passed with high grades, you know. So in a sense, they managed to create their own optimal best student environment. But they did it on their own initiative. That's, nothing came from us to sort of suggest they should work along these lines, right? We have just done some interactive things what we do at the master program. So, um, and you won't think that it's so, they are really cruel. So it's it's really like, oh my yeah, God. It's, like, it's, 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 you have to, and they to are hard learned. with deadlines. And, 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 and yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that that works out quite well until somebody gets hurt yeah. and then you have to step in. and then that's that's sometimes a problem but i agree this peer feedback could work um 
we also discussed that a week ago, so, um, but I haven't done it really in one of the classes, to be honest, okay. so far. But, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, I was also curious if that really works well when it comes to a proper um, lecture, or not lecture, but proper format, so to say, yeah. Interesting. Any burning last questions? Yes, I see a hand. Two hands, one and a half hand, but I see a microphone. Please go <laughs> ahead. Uh, my name is uh, my name is uh, Adriana Brusca. I'm a PhD student. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It was amazing. Uh, it's just a consideration because I understood that the starting point is that uh, no one attended a course on how to teach before to be a teacher or a professor. Uh, but we saw that there are different generations and that each generation has uh, specific characteristics and the challenge is to adapt ourselves to this kind of characteristics. Uh, probably um, my opinion is that um, generation run <laughs> in terms that we have to adapt continuously to these kind of changements. So basically the idea in my opinion is that we have to have uh, at first, a preparatory course to uh, to be uh, ready on how to teach, and then, in my opinion, we have to adjourn ourselves. It's con it's a continuous process, in my opinion. So it's just to underline this point. I have a question that is really should waiting. I should I just comment? You know, yeah, quickly. Yeah, I I agree with you. That would be perfect if you when you start at university did you get a course um, how to teach um, with some pedagogical concepts and then you adapt. Um, what is the main problem? And and I think since you you are one of the younger generations, I guess. So um, I also consider myself one of the younger generations. So, but in my faculty, a lot of them are maybe baby boomer, but also when it comes to X and Y. Sorry to say that I'm not a digital native. So, and many, and I would say 80%, 90%, 90% of all professors, faculty, which we have at the faculty or at the Europa Institute as lecturers are non-digital natives. Um, and when you speak about the biggest cut between generations, that's the question of digitalization. Um, and that is really, and we sometimes do not speak the same language. Um, so, but I agree with you, that would be perfect. So, but to, to raise the awareness that there is this cut between digital native and non-digital native, um, if you're aware of that, you can cope with a lot of things much easier or you're aware that you have to cope with them because before that you haven't. So that's the thing. So um, My question is, considering the importance of uh, the skills, uh, do you think that there is a need to develop uh, courses of study with specific subjects dedicated to, to the skills? I mean, alongside the, the core exams, for instance? Um, we haven't done that in, in our project. Me personally, I think that, of course, language skills and um, working in international context is something what you, of course, should address more with European and international law. Although, for example, as I said, I live um, close to the French border. Um, all our students need to have that. So, um, because we, we live in a binational, bilingual um, context, so to say. Um, all of the other things, I have to say, I'm sure all of the students would benefit from it. Um, I don't think that there is one subject which should deal with that in a higher extent than others. It would be the perfect world would each subject thinks about how to do that. Or you say, okay, we do, there are two approaches. In, you integrate it in each subject, in each lecture, so to say, or each format, or you do something that's sometimes done in the US. You have basic knowledge and then plus courses, transversal competences with different formats. So, but I don't consider any of them more special for any subject, to be honest. Thank <laughs> you.
sorry. Good evening. Uh, I am a PhD student and uh, in civil law, and I wanted, first of all, to thank you for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, in particular, I really enjoyed the part in which there is the division between all the generations, because I um, actually thought about it, and uh, it is true that we need, especially uh, you teachers, think about maybe a new method which can, in my opinion, the most important thing is not only convey some notions, but also prepare the students for the job. So after the university, meaning there must be a little uh, gap between the academia world and the job world. And in my opinion, this could also reach by for example, different and several instruments that you mentioned. For example, simulations, for example, moots. I had the chance in Belgrade to study in Belgrade, but also in, um, in the Netherlands. And what I noticed is that the difference uh, between Italy and uh, those places, but maybe uh, there is not um, an average that is the, the right one, is that in Italy um, we prefer the um, oral lectures. So the one you were talking about, for example, um, one hour of professor talking, which I like as uh, a kind of uh, uh, preparation, but also instead in the Netherlands, in Belgrade, there is more a practical, let's say, uh, approach. So moot competitions, slides, simulation, maybe these kind of uh, uh, exercises unified with, of course, the oral classes can, um, um, let's say, make a little bit little the, um, the difference between the academia world and the job, because the, the students prepare themselves in order to then uh, be in the court, to be in a trial, they learn how to speak. So, in my opinion, the, maybe, my opinion, the best um, solution is uh, the one that finds an average, let's say, between the, the two approaches, the two main approaches. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good. This, yes. <laughs> now comes the exam question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can I sit here? Um, sure. Yeah. I belong to the Neanderthal generation, so I struggle always <laughs> with microphones and everything. A few things. Uh, first, thank you very much. It was very impressive, and if I consider that you have to work <laughs> in a hurry. So th thank you very much. And you have just to consider many issues. Um, the first answer, there is no training for professors. No, they know me, I think. So, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> they know me. So, and I won't arrive. <laughs> the right to be anonymous. <laughs> The beauty of being Marco would be that I could live in Sicily. So, but yeah, unfortunately. Uh, there is no training for university professors in Italy. It is not provided for. When associate professors are required, they have to deliver a lecture, but the hand is not to evaluate their ability to teach, but rather their knowledge, their university knowledge. Uh, there is an evaluation which is carried out by students. At the end of courses, students evaluate uh, the courses as such. So, so the criteria are very different from this. Uh, I'm not sure that they will contribute to mild our teaching in order to face the challenges which are entrenched in teaching to new generations. The worst matter is that such evaluation now are considering in public requirement competition. So professors are evaluated and can proceed in their career taking into consideration the opinions of students. To be frank, I dislike it. Because we jeopardize very high marks given by professors who want to proceed in their university career. So it's a good system, but it's very important to um, establish how have to use students' evaluation. Yes, how to handle them. Uh, you, you, you said 
that students want to receive good feedback. Since I belong to the old school, I don't share your point of view, to be frank. Because my idea is that we, we consider students, I know that my students. Not good. Yeah, just, just, just the point of departure is that. Enough good, positive feedback. Positive, that's, that's yes, positive, positive so. feedback. Okay, I always consider I'm the enemy of my students. I never consider the students my enemy. So this is a point, different point of view. Uh, positive feedback. We, we belong to an era in which parents tend to hide all mistakes of their children. An era in which schools and universities tend to hide all loopholes, all, all in the knowledge of students. So giving positive feedback could be, could be, once again, dangerous. My fear is that we consider students as People have to be protected against society. The outer world is cruel. So we, we jeopardize once again, not to make a good job and to prepare death for life. That's my fear. We tend to protect students. Are good students, are good students. Sometimes they're not good students. I want to say, you are not a good student. We, we, we did, we did. I, I remember, this was our experience. I know that my students will, will criticize me, but I remember that in my age, when we live in the rocks, professors' opinions were important. Today's professors' opinions are not important at all. Parents tend to defend uh, their kids, though they are 20 years old, but they are kids against professors. I don't think that's good. The, the, the third point, you said we have to adapt to students. Once again, I would like to understand your opinion. Should we have to adapt to the low level of students' knowledge? Because no, 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 once again, this is, this is a problem. There is a trend of impoverishment of culture, generally speaking. And the big wave is still to come as a consequence of the pandemics and the online teaching, which is nothing at all, as I say things. It's not teaching, just spending two hours before the screen with the students. Black screen. The black screen, yes, students yeah. doing something else. Yeah. To be frank, to be frank. So do we have to adapt? Because this is what happened, in fact, that we tend to adapt to the low knowledge of students. And the, lower, uh, the level is coming lower and lower. So if you have to adapt to your technologies, I can struggle. If you have to change my teaching and the content of my lectures because they don't understand. I, I don't agree, to, to be frank. Because I think the aim is to rise standards, not to lower standards. And this is the aim and the task of universities. And this is also a way to make society work. Because we will improve the knowledge of those who are not so lucky to study. And they are help or to study in a familiar environment can support them and to make them progress in their life. The last point, very sorry, but I get it. I told you, you asked me to, to think. The, the last point, you said, we have to take into consideration the market and the way in which it works. That's good for masters. I don't feel it's good for bachelor courses. And this is the problem. The gap between the two. And how, how to, because when you know, see students struggling master studies because they have not the method to approach master studies. They have more a theoretical approach. And when they have to struggle with cases and so on, they, 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 they are in trouble. And that's my experience. So the, the point is we can't shape university studies in order to take into consideration only the market and the way in which it works. We have to fill up the gap between the two levels of studies. Last but not least, we can make, we can involve students when the, low, the number of students is low. If you have 300 students watching you, you can't. But this is democracy. This is a step towards a democratic society. So the, the, the real challenge is to combine the two, having a good um, teaching with a high number of students, not leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. And sorry for being so, so long. <laughs> They want to pass. <laughs> 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 I'm stressing on your positive feedback. That's good, yeah.
Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, um, it's difficult to speak uh, after Marco speaking, uh, but uh, I think that uh, there is another question to consider. In this moment, um, I am a, I, in a person uh, of Generation X because I was born in 1980. But uh, I think that in this moment, there is another problem. You write there that a soft skill is a critical, self-critical thinking. Now, the young people is uh, uh, receive a waterfall of information from uh, uh, social networks, uh, newspaper, online paper, uh, online newspaper, and so on. And according a gender perspective, a gender uh, teaching, we have to consider also the importance uh, to give to the people tools to understand the true and the false news received, the true and the false information received. Because in this moment, probably they receive many suggestions, too many suggestions. And our uh, aim is becoming not only give information, but also give the tools to understand true or false information. And we have to understand that digitalization is not only how to use uh, personal computers or uh, any instrument, but also how social networks works and how we can give to young people, to our students, the tools to become a debunker and understand the truth and the reality. Okay, thank you. That's, by the way, um, we have the information management skills. That's something what is crucial when we teach to make them understand what is a good and what is a bad source. So um, not only our job, already the job of a school teacher and already the job of the parents, to be honest. So that um, because there's too much fake in the world and uh, this we have to fight from the very beginning. I'm not so sure if we can really cope with that only on university level, but I agree with you. And that's one of the soft skills what they should have. Uh, before I just can hand, I just uh, just uh, yes, just a second. Uh, just it works. it works. So just a few comments. I think that our uh, role and job is not neither to please students in a way how you explained, nor to blame the, them uh, up to uh, their crying or humiliation, just to add that possibility as well, because I know stu uh, professors who humiliate students. I think, and also, uh, we are not enemies of them, and they are not our en we We are on the common job, meaning that uh, we can speak about two pedagogical approaches. One, tradi the traditional one, uh, which considers authority in a very different way to one which I think is pedagogically justifiable. That is much more uh, democratic in a metaphorical uh, uh, way, but that's uh, uh, developing authority on the quality, on argumentation, so no blaming, no pleasing, but uh, uh, arg giving arg arg arguments. Uh, substantial ones and also concerning the quality of what they did. So stimulating them, explaining what could have been done better, etc., etc. So I think the uh, difference between authority, which is uh, based on hierarchy, on the ex cathedra, traditional approach, is one thing. Another one is creating different kind of authority and interactivity. Very good was the scale, not scale, 
you mentioned a few things which students uh, like to, to get uh, equality, so it means respect for them, interactivity, and feedback. Feedback does not mean, in my opinion, only this, uh, characterizing them, but interactivity in a sense that we put into question our work and them and discuss with them, so something very different. Thank you. Any comment? Um, yeah, first, I, I think I was misunderstood. It's not about pleasing any student. It's about what has to be kept in mind. Um, moreover, I think I come from a different country with a lot of faculties. Um, I know also in Italy there are a lot of law faculties, but maybe Palermo is a different story due to the location. We are in a huge competition with many, many um, universities. That's not the case in Serbia. So at one point, we also have to think from that point of view, to be honest. And of course, a student nowadays is going first in Germany to traditional universities. We are not a traditional university. We were founded after the Second World War, so we are not competing with Munich, Bonn, Berlin or any other. So I personally studied also as a, at a traditional university in Bonn. So that's my alma mater. So, um, but um, then second choice is, are you prepared for the future market? And I'm sorry to say that I agree with you. There should be a balance between, and, and that's also something, I'm not an expert in bachelor master system because we don't have that. Um, I'm an not an expert, but I'm familiar with postgraduate master systems. I learned a lot about Bologna systems, but of course, how a bachelor system should be should look like it's it's a bit dif bit different. I think the biggest challenge of universities nowadays, and that's maybe not something only what applies to law, but mainly to law, I would say, is to keep the balance between high quality and scientific and academic research. Um, meaning to um, teach also new developments and on the other hand preparing um, students for the job market and to teach transversal competences. That's the biggest challenge we might face at the moment. Um, that is what I wanted to say. Um, not saying that we have to please students. Positive feedback doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be only good feedback. Positive feedback means how you bring or how you communicate the feedback. That's how it is said. Um, and, and that's what I wanted to say. It's not about pleasing students. Um, um, and that's why I think it was maybe misunderstood. And of course, um, and that is the question when you offer master programs um, or like us, a ma post-credit master program, you have to look at the market, especially when you um, put tuition fees. Tuition fees, that's something completely not used in Germany. Our idea and it's constitution, constitutionally um, protected is education is free of charge. So um, for postgraduate masters and master's programs, we are now allowed to do that. But if we want to do that, we have to bring a very, very high quality, otherwise nobody's paying. Um, and, and if I pay for education, then the quality has to be high. I'm sorry to say that. If I get, I want to get out something of my money, it has to be worth that I'm paying for something. Um, and not that ju I just get a degree, to be honest, because then your reputation is destroyed after three years. So when employer realize that the degree, what they get with the, with the employees is not worth their money or the salary, I'm sorry to say that then the reputation is bad and on the German market, um, we are not able to, 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 to do that. So um, that's why I also come from that perspective. But I agree, um, the academic research skills should be high. And one main output I have mentioned that of the Mela um, project is an online uh, course on academic research skills because we have realized that our students have problems uh, with that. Um, and all faculties also to explaining them what is a good and what is a bad source, by the way. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I wanted to say. Thank you. 
I had a little remark between Dragiska and Marco here, um, thinking about, I, th I agree with you, uh, with the digital literacy for students. I mean, yes, we have to be aware, it's a skill they need to practice, but it's also uh, useful to think about whether we are in the best position to ensure that they fully get it. Uh, I'm aware about a project at the University in Essex where they have, um, the law unit has liaised themselves with Amnesty International. Uh, went to the media department and have um, students voluntarily on their free time, so it's not a course grade, learn um, digital literacy as a media critics. Uh, so they get a briefing on that and then they start screening open source material in areas where there have been human rights violations. So Amnesty gets the data treated and screened. It's open source, so it's all free there, but you need to know what you're doing when you start looking at it. Is it true or is it false, right? and the university has packed it into a research project. So again, doing working to your strength, right? <laughs> How do you find your partners to actually be able to, to work to your strength? Good. I see no hands. I see two clapping hands. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, both of you. Um, dinner is to take place in the garden. Professor Ollino, tomorrow's speaker, was operated today of appendicitis. So we delayed uh, the lecture tomorrow morning. She promised to give the lecture on Wednesday afternoon, and we and we hope so for for her, of course. So we will meet tomorrow afternoon for the meeting on the Asmus Mundus. And we will meet on Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock as is established. In the hope that Professor Lino will be not here, but will deliver her lecture. If, if she can't, we will inform you in, in time. And we will decide how to manage Wednesday afternoon. Okay? So thank you very much and enjoy the dinner. <laughs>